We're going to go ahead and get started. This is Sally. Um, yes, Dave and I We're going to go ahead and get started. This is so. Sally. Um, yeah. Why is it getting that? Here, wait. Let's try this. Anyway, we have a little issue here, but we're going to go ahead and let everybody introduce themselves. So you know, we have a couple people here at the chamber um, with us. So um, we're going to let them go first. And then if you can go around and introduce yourself and then remute your mic so we can have feedback while Dave's talking. Um, and thank you for being here today to help us um, continue our nonprofit meeting, even though we're doing it in a little different fashion. Denise. You want to introduce yourself? You want to introduce yourself? Yeah. 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 Okay. On behalf of the Nancy Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sean Tate with Project King. Great. Okay. So let's go around. Jenny, you want to start? Uh, my name is Jenny Hildebrand, and I am a volunteer with Grace United Methodist Church and our Adult Learning Center there. And our Adult Learning Center there. Are you guys at the chamber all in? <laughs> if, if there's any way to move to separate offices, all this feedback will stop. I can't hear you, Sal. You have to talk. All of our mics are muted here, um, so the feedback's coming from other sources. All right, let's carry on with introductions. Thanks, Jenny. Anyone else? Dave Hughes, East Valley Men Center. Karen Brown, a new leaf. Alicia Holmes, Mace United Way. Kathleen Wynn, Dalek and Sex Trafficking, Project 25. Jill Holmes with uh, Heal Hero Foundation. Sorry. Melissa Forrester with United Food Bank. Mark Young, United Way, Mace United Way. I see several others on the call. Anybody else that want to introduce themselves? If not, I guess you can remain anonymous. <laughs> Jason Taylor, Other Side Jason, Ministry. Other Side Ministry. Kristen Harvey, Jewish Family and Children's Service. It's your, it's your ball game. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead and ask everybody to mute. Okay, so uh, it'd be a good time for everybody to mute your line. If you're not muted now, we're getting a few little feedback issues. And if you stay muted, unless you want to talk, it should minimize that issue. So um, my name is Dave Richens. I'm with United Food Bank. Uh, it, Jenny, it's an honor to have you on the line with us too, who has a long history with your organization as well. Um, we're, Sally asked me to host uh, a, a virtual uh, meeting of the Nonprofit Vitality Council. There's a few people here with us in the room at uh, Cham the Cham Mesa Chamber of Commerce. We really, I think, want to have a conversation about first how some of our nonprofit partners are doing as far as meeting the, the increase in demand or what kind of demand response you're getting. And then uh, we can have a conversation about resourcing. Um, the United Food Bank uh, is, in, is very well positioned right now to meet our current crisis. We have a little over 2 million pounds of square, uh, 2 million pounds of food in our warehouse ready to be delivered. We have additional storage at Mesa Cold Storage right now. So we're telling our food distribution partners to please 
distribute everything you have on your shelves, we will replenish you. So if you are a, a, an agency of ours and you're on this call and you do a food distribution, please distribute to depletion. Uh, we will restock you. We do have plenty of food. We have 35 loads scheduled for the next 30 days to come in as well. So um, let's get the food out on the streets. But one of the things I tell my staff is it's far better for food to be on the shelves of our clients than on the shelves of our food banks. So there's no reason to be hoarding at this time. Um, I know a lot of people are panicking and wanting to store food uh, because they, they feel uh, they're not sure if they're gonna be locked in their homes. Um, let's try to stay focused on our low and modern income, most vulnerable residents, those that have homelessness issues or other mental illness issues, our seniors, those that meet our current income eligibilities. Um, there are a lot of conversations going on about expanding beyond that. Um, we're not sure where that's going to go at this time, but if you do, if you've lost your job, you're suddenly income eligible. So uh, make sure your clients keep that in in mind. Um, the uh, the the other caution I've been telling folks is try to work within existing networks as much as possible. Uh, we have uh, a great nonprofit backbone in the East Valley. We have uh, partners like the Chamber of Commerce, different businesses, the cities, uh, Mesa and Apache Junction and Gilbert and Chandler and Tempe and folks that want to help. Um, but let's not try to create new networks to meet this demand outside of what exists because I think our, our current networks and our current rules and requirements and paperwork, all those things work. Um, they've developed to be in the fashion that they are for a reason. There's good regulations, regulatory reasons why some of these things are in place. Now, we do need to find, uh, make a few adjustments to that. One, you know, in extraordinary circumstances, we want to consider how do we provide service delivery uh, uh, in a safe way that follows uh, World Health Organization and, and uh, Center for Disease Control Standards. So think about your operations and what you're doing for service delivery and how you might make a few simple adjustments or even dramatic adjustments in order to do it more safely. Um, we all know that you know we should do more frequent hand washing, hand sanitizing, social distancing, the six foot rule. Um, uh, one of the, I'll tell a quick story about how United Food Bank has done this, and, and then uh, if others have some examples they want to share, it might be a good time for that. We do a distribution, as most of you know, every Friday over at our volunteer warehouse on Havelina Drive. And uh, that Help Yourself program has been growing uh, a bit over the years. Uh, we right now are distributing, it used to be a co-op model, right now we're distributing all um, uh, basically free products through TFAP and, and trade mitigation and uh, some bonus foods that we get from USDA. Um, so we typically on a Friday see anywhere from four to 550 uh, number of families, about 500 is our average. On Friday, last Friday, we saw 1200. Um, we planned for that by keeping people out of our warehouse. We utilized our shopping carts. We didn't let the public touch anything within our warehouse. We did all the intake from a six foot distance. Uh, we washed and gloved everything. We double sanitized our shopping carts. We had volunteers fill those shopping carts and then meet the client after the check-in table, uh, push it to their trunk, load it in their trunk and not have the clients touch that cart in any way. When it came back into the warehouse, we double sanitized it. So we had one stop where somebody wiped down the whole cart. It went a little bit further uh, in the line and then it got wiped down again before new food was loaded into it. So it was just little adjustments. What we found was we could move twice as fast doing that model rather than our conventional model. Now, I love it when people can come in our warehouse and they can select the items that they prefer in more of a choice model. That is, is the optimum. It provides dignity, it provides choice to people. I don't believe people that are hungry should just have what we give them, but they should be able to have what they want. And so we need to make sure that we continue to serve our clients with dignity, but we also realize that we have larger volume. So whatever solution you come up with, you need to think about it at scale. So you know, can, can you do 100 people in that model? Can you do 1,000 in that model? Could you do 5,000 in that model? So we are preparing, uh, so we are now moving our distribution to the Mesa Convention Center for Friday to go to an all drive-through model. 
we're utilizing our partnership with the city of Mesa to facilitate that move and make that happen and make sure we advertise it. We'll have people who will be posted at the old location that give maps to where we're supposed to go. We think that will, the only thing we couldn't do well at Havelina uh, distribution was that the social distancing of clients in line was not optimum. People just don't know how far six feet is and people just want to crowd in line and it just drove me crazy. We tried to deal with it, but our lines contain a lot of vulnerable residents. So we felt we had to change this model to drive through so we could maintain that social distancing. So that was a big deal. So that was our experience. It turned out great. Um, There's a few hiccups, uh, but not anything too bad that we couldn't adjust on the fly. Like for example, we had three check-in stations. We quickly had to have, add two more to make sure. We don't want people to have to wait in line for very long. Um, the, lo the longest uh, we got reported was about 30 minutes. Um, we had it down to 20 pretty quick. So um, that was, that was our experience with uh, some adjustments to our operations. Obviously, there's a lot more throughout the organization uh, doing our distributions, but uh, we want to turn it over to some folks. We have a few questions here. Um, should I read the questions yeah. or should we take comments first? Uh, well, comments first, if anybody has anything. All right, let's, let's go, before we go to the comments, the Zoom group chat, all of you guys see that. Um, Let's concentrate on solutions that we can do at scale rather than uh, looking at one-off issues because, I mean, we can consume our entire day thinking about that one client that I, I personally delivered a box of food to an elderly blind person last week. So, I mean, we all have that story, um, but let's talk about solutions at scale because we think that this is going to continue to grow over the next six weeks. And so let's focus less, less on those individual solutions. So let's uh, open it up to anyone who wants to uh, share. This is Arlen. Can you hear me? Apparently not. Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Arlen. Hey, Arlen. Uh, okay. I just want to mention that there are quite a few foundations out there that are coming up with money for people to help with food. I'm, I'm, pretty active in contacting people. And uh, if you look around, a lot of the, the foundations you tradi traditionally work with are doing extra right now. Arlen, could you talk about the adjustments you made to your service, your uh, evening meal? Yeah, for the nightly meal, we're uh, basically doing, you can either walk through or ride through. We're setting tables outside, so the dining room is closed. We're setting tables outside. We're putting together packaged meals. And uh, then the volunteers are putting two meals out at a time. We let two guests out in at a time. It actually works pretty good. We got through 140 people in uh, about an hour and a half last night. Uh, now, Arlen, was that your total demand? Did you serve to to the last person in line, or did you have to we, cut it we off? We did. No one got turned away. So there were. There were about 140 that showed up. That's that's less than we normally serve in our dining room, but that's that's what we're seeing. Okay, thanks, Harlan. Well, I can I can speak to the East Valley Men's Center. As far as uh, our volunteer dinner groups, we've uh, luckily they've been able to be a little flexible, where they're uh, now just dropping off the food at the back. Uh, where the kitchen is and we take it from there and we'll do the serving some have resorted to just uh, providing monetary funds towards meals or food um, but other than that you know being a, a a program 120 day program we got we got the guys practicing social distancing washing your hands making sure we're clamping down on that but as far as any changes uh, regarding the meals that's the only part is uh, letting them drop off the food or uh, you know give us money for it. Um, if you d get a uh, donation, how are you providing the meal with with just a cash donation? Cat, well, the cash donation would go into our accounting and then we would use the funds to buy the supplies on, on the days that uh, those church groups were scheduled to um, provide meals, then we would use it towards however we could is there any thought to uh, partnering with maybe some local restaurants to provide meals? So if we get some cash assistance, there's, there might be 
some partners, some local restaurants, we wanted to take that money and spend it with them to provide a meal to help keep their kitchens busy and keep people employed. Is that a consideration that anybody's had there? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good thought. And, and we do have some restaurant agreements that we already partner with that uh, uh, drop off food and we pick up, we pick up food at a couple different restaurants. Yeah, always trying to think of uh, different ways we can have partnerships and 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 uh, triple wins. You know, if we can keep people employed and at work, and keep people fed at the same time, that's always a win. Who else we have out there? And if nobody asks a question, I'm going to have Mark Young play the saxophone again. So everybody, people start to need to start talking. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um. I have a lot of people that are asking, can you turn your volume down? Um, a lot of people that are asking about uh, volunteer opportunities is pause. Um, and Dave, are you still looking for healthy volunteers or what's that situation? Yeah, so we welcome volunteers in our volunteer warehouse. We've limited each group to about 20. Now people say, oh, it's supposed to be 10, you know, but, but we space them in our warehouse in such a manner that we have 10 folks working on one side of the warehouse, 10 working on the other side of the warehouse. So we could use, I think we're booked through the middle of next week right now, which is awesome, um, but we can always use more people reach out we think this is going to last for a while so and scheduled is a plus for us between five and fifty years old should be the focus we can take older volunteers if they feel healthy but they need to understand the risks and so the reason we've been asking for the younger volunteers is they've seemed to be less vulnerable to the effects of the virus um, and but we welcome our older friends. We love it. They they are the core of our regular volunteers. We just want each one of them to understand that it puts them in the line of fire to be in our warehouse because we are you know we're we're on the front lines of this. We cannot stop and we will not close our doors. So we need people that are willing to to be there and take a few risks to uh, to keep us open. But we want to make sure every one of our volunteers understands that those risks and they also need to understand what we're doing to mitigate them. Uh, Arlen, what do you need? We actually have cut way down on the volunteers that we need. So we're, we're pretty well situated. We have people calling in to offer, but we only, we're only using five each night instead of 20 or 25. So we don't really have any additional volunteer opportunities right now. Does anybody else need? I'll tell you what I- um, Volunteers? If anyone has it, I'm, I'm looking for one of these uh, uh, hands, for, uh, forehead thermometers so we can check people's temperatures so we can try and get a feeling if there is anyone uh, that that's sick. It, we if we had the thermometer, and I've looked all over at, uh, Amazon and other places, I can't I can't find one. If anyone has any ideas on where to get a, a forehead thermometer that's hands free? I'll tell you what, we'll push that out along uh, on our social network stuff and see if we can't find somebody that has one, Arlen. All right, great, thanks. Um, hey, you know what? We we may have one at the office. We had those ones that we use for the the uh, health fair. Yep. So if I can get over there and I find one, I'll drop one by tomorrow, Arlen. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have just have our uh, laser temperature thermometers we use to check temperature on food, but uh, <laughs> you could probably get uh, pretty close. <laughs> you were a side of beef. <laughs> I think where you have to place those thermometers is not really the best thing there, Dave. They're laser pointed for the thermometer. Oh, laser pointed. Gotcha. All right, and we're going to Mark Young on the saxophone. <laughs> hey, I'm concerned as, as I've been for a while, we're trying to figure out housing for folks. Um, CBI ran across a patient that had been tested for the virus, um, hadn't got the test results back yet. The hospital had released her. They found her at the airport. Trying to find her a place to stay was really difficult. We found a hotel in downtown Phoenix, CBI did, found a hotel in downtown Phoenix that has laid off all of their cleaning staff and are renting the rooms that everybody's on their own. Um, sounds like a giant problem to me. So we just got off the phone with uh, some folks in Chandler, a church there that's willing to 
uh, tent, 35 uh, people. We're looking for 10 by 10 tents that will be 35 feet apart. Um, but they have to get some permission from the county island. We'd like to use that to house uh, the number of aging out foster kids. We continue to get phone calls about every single day. Um, but we need to duplicate that in as many places as possible. When I talked to Natalie today, it's like, you know, we can provide porta potties. Or they're, they're, they're considering, you know, providing porta potties and other kinds of equipment that we might need, maybe including the tents, but no staff salaries. No, none of those dollars can go to people cost. And uh, as you can well imagine, that's a problem. So I've been dealing with some churches and some smaller entities to maybe host or keep 35 people, but so far we're at a bit of a standstill. Yeah, Mark, I'm getting a number of complaints from homeless people here that the uh, bathroom facilities and the parks have been shut down. They've all been locked. So I don't know if, if there's porta potties available from the city, then we should get them out there. That's what I think too. So I will, I will pass that along. I mean, um, I, I don't really know the difference between having the bathrooms open in the park or putting porta potties in the park. Um, I would think that's the same problem. I understand that they don't want to have city staff cleaning those. I get it. I really do get it. Uh, well, we've we've left ours open, so our bathrooms are open seven o'clock in the morning, and we have staff cleaning them. Yeah, uh, but. Sometimes when people are sleeping two miles away, it's a long ways to go. To well, and you know, people ain't walking two miles to take a dump. That's just all there is to it. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't mean to be disgusting, but that's just the truth. So, I mean, I was walking in a park the other day, and uh, anyway, the bathrooms were locked. So, it's a problem. Uh, we are working at that and having those conversations. I know Candace is working overtime to see if she can figure that out um, or not a lot. So open to ideas. So um, stash at home? Mark Hirschberg is saying that they are closed uh, in all but nine parks. So I'm, I'm guessing those are kind of the major parks like Riverview and some of the larger parks. I just texted Mark Hirschberg while you were talking. Uh, all right. So there are some that are still open. Uh, I'm having, Alicia, uh, staffing, so that's why. I understand that. Alicia, did you see that from uh, from David that they're looking for a no touch thermometer as well? You have to unmute yourself, otherwise we just see your list. I I thought I did. Sorry. Yes, yeah. I will look and see how many we have, and I'll reach All right. out. All right. I know this seems like silliness that somebody's talking. I'm going to talk. Um, it seems like it's horrible. silly for the the city to it, it seems like more of a health risk to have people not have a bathroom than to have people clean the bathrooms that are you know protected in protective gear so i don't i mean i don't know if we need to talk to the city but if people are going to the bathroom in the parks in unsafe areas it seems like it would be worth bringing people back on to make sure those places are safe i, I think um, the question is whether they have protective gear yeah, I mean, if that's the problem. It's got a response from Mark Hirschberg. He says, the contractor has lost most of their staff and they are frantically running out of supplies to clean and stock them to the point that they are supplementing their supply. They're only able to keep nine open because they don't have the supplies. Uh, they don't have the supplies to clean them. They're just running out of stuff because everybody's hoarding it all. Uh, Alicia's right. It's a huge, huge health risk right now. I mean, yeah, the city of San Diego did that a year ago, shut down their toilets thinking they would solve the homeless problems, and they had a tremendous health problem uh, for six issue. months. Yeah, so the issue isn't a, a open, closed out of, out of a response to this, but that their contractor who cleans the bathrooms just doesn't have the supply to clean them. So they, they're keeping nine open strategically that they have the supplies for. And then he says also that before they closed them, people were stealing all the paper supplies out of them. I'm sure that's true. Dave, do you know what nine? I'd like to know what strategic means. Well, I'm guessing that they're, uh, that's my word, not his. Uh, I'm guessing that they're spread out uh, around the city. 
or they're the largest parks. I'll see if I can get a list out of him. Okay. That's like getting real time information, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and you know, I mean, my God, what is wrong with people? Uh, stealing toilet paper from public bathrooms. Trying we had to, to secure that at the community college. I love it when Alicia and Joe pop up on back and forth. You know, it's like one's inside the trailer, one's outside the trailer. One's <laughs> I'm coming over for a game of, I come over for shuffleboard area. later. Go ahead. Well, the problem is, is if we're in the same area, then we just totally, you know, the sound reverberates. So we have to be in different areas. This is my outside office. And it looks fabulous. All right, anybody else on that wants to share maybe some operational changes that they've made or some needs that they're starting to experience? Again, try to concentrate on solutions that we can do at scale. Hey, Jenny, can you hear us? Can you speak for a minute? I think she left. Nope, she's right there. I think she's back. Jenny, we can't hear you. Are, you. are you muted? Can you now? Yeah, perfect. You okay. What's your church doing? I just um, got our email. church is stark at this point. Um, we are trying to take care of our own membership uh, by having a system of people calling everybody. Uh, so, like, I call five members every day and check on them to see mostly our seniors and those who are shut in. Um, but we also have a newsletter that's going out almost daily with information about here's where the senior shopping hours are and uh, if you need something and can't get it, give this person or that person a call. Um, we've been doing a little bit of gathering of uh, things like disposable face masks for use. Um, for janitorial companies that are called in after the fact to clean up um, commercial businesses and they don't have enough of those and can't get their hands on them very easily. So we're not doing an awful lot, but we're getting a new pastor on Monday. <laughs> so there's lots, um, lots of upheaval in our congregation right now. Um, I just got a, I got a text from the mayor about 10 minutes ago that he's trying to get a, con, a Zoom call in with uh, church folks on Friday through Four okay. City. So you guys be looking for an invite to that, okay? Okay. Throw, from Four Great. City, okay. Hey, Mark, this is Ray Villa. Yeah, how are you, Ray? Good, good. Hey, uh, I got a call today from a lady who... Uh, has a small mobile home park here in Apache Junction, and she is interested in getting involved somehow to house some of, to provide some kind of affordable housing kind of deal. Uh, she just wants to come in and talk to me tomorrow. She's going to talk to me tomorrow about it. I don't know how big her park is. I don't know the extent of anything yet, but I just want to share that with you in the event that you know there might be something that could, could be done with this. Um, I just told her, I'm sure that, that there's a definite need for it, but I just don't know to what extent she wants to get involved, how, much, what, how, how big her park is, where it's located, or anything like that. She just reached out to me today, wants to meet, and, and I told her I would, I would meet with her and talk to her about it and see what we could do. Well, Ray, that's, that's exciting. Here's a place that we could maybe help her out. We do need places for aging out foster kids. They have some stipend that comes from the state that would probably take care of their rent. And our folks oh, at Western 360 would be uh, open to, re, you know, continuing to do uh, support services with them as far as food and all that kind of stuff. So I, I probably want to hook you up with Candace. Have you met her? Uh, That's all right. I don't know if I have. Yeah. Um, so after you're done with that tomorrow, let's have a conversation. And if that's something she's interested in, I'll hook her up with Candace. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, a couple of pieces of information that have come in. If you go to mesaaz.gov, they do have on their COVID-19 emergency response page all of the city of Mesa closures that are in place uh, regarding museums and departments. Uh, the nine parks that remain open, um, Mr. Young, are Countryside, Eastmark Park by the Lake, Greenfield, Pioneer, Quail Run, 
Red Mountain Lake, Red Mountain Park, and Riverview. So, so um, not, not Kleinemann, which needs it. They're the large, they're the large parks uh, in, they're the, they're the largest parks uh, in the city and they're strategically placed around the city. Yeah. We have a few folks here in the room. Anybody want to talk about some of the things that they're seeing as far as uh, uh, demand, increased in demand, changes to your operations? Uh, Larry, what are you seeing from a veteran standpoint? Get out of the bathtub, Larry. He's, yeah, come come on social distance with somebody you're used to not social distancing with. We're gonna we're gonna put him put him next to Sally. I I, I presume that they're. Uh... They've been social distancing for months. Hey, Larry, what up? Are you doing counseling? <laughs> yeah. Go. Okay. My bad. Oh, sorry. It was me. My uh, so we're still working with Arizona at work on their uh, employment programs and some of their efforts that they're putting forth. They're still coming in on Mondays. We're making sure we clean up the facility before and after they leave each and every time. We still have, of course, our veterans benefit counselors who are working out of the office. They are doing so by primarily by, um, by phone and over the internet, of course, but they're still available uh, in, in the case that they might they need to be met. Um, we're also working on, primarily we're working on some funding opportunities. A lot of the, a lot of things that we're, we're honestly, we need to do, we need to be working on for the last, the last several, several months, but we haven't had the time to. So we're trying to be available. Um, we've actually placed items outside of our door with our signage so they can still call in, they can still reach both our center <laughs> Um, we still have our, our people mobilized, if you will, so they're working remotely from home and they're still answering phones, so people are able to, to, to still get the help and the navigation services that they require. But we're trying to be as creative as we can, just like everyone else, just trying to, trying to survive this fun. Good. Yeah, I think the key here is uh, the public needs to see the social safety net continuing to operate. It sends a really troubling signal if you when you close your doors. And so we wanna be cognizant about keeping our employees safe and making sure we follow you know, those councils, but try to, I mean, the people that we serve are the most vulnerable amongst us. And so our, our staff, the message I sent to our staff is, is we've had a lot of our front office staff wanna work from home. And I, I just told them, I said, if our, if our warehouse people and our drivers uh, have to come into work, everybody needs to come into work. This is a shared experience. We're gonna get through it together. And I know that that is a, a risky proposition, but I don't believe that part of my staff I can sacrifice over the other. So we're all gonna do it together. So um, I appreciate hearing that, Larry, that uh, we're finding creative ways to continue with service delivery. I think we have some, another folks, uh, what was your name again? I'm not gonna try to repeat that, but you're up over here. <laughs> While we're waiting, hey, I wanna tell you, we have shut down Vita sites for a while. I think that's critically important to me. All of our volunteers, not all, most of our volunteers are older people. The people that we are working with are older people. We'd met with over three, about 3,000, I think, in the last month. Because the IRS has extended the date, I don't feel like we need to be doing that right now. We are taking drop-offs for people who are in need of their uh, EITC. A lot of our, a lot of the places where we were hosting them shut down. So Red Mountain Library, and so we're just doing what we can. Larry's working. Uh, we're trying to do what we can uh, at the office remotely. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty reasonable adjustment. All right. Uh, uh, we're very new on this team, and we're very grateful to be on the team. Uh, project case. We try to study the case uh, in the community, but we can work with other organizations as they've been doing. Uh, we went through we went through the same case in other part of the world, and we applied strategy when the virus was killing people, and there were so many uh, donations coming full is good, but first of all, we have to re-strategize and think how we can uh, combat it so you can have more cases coming up. 
in the, our community. Uh, that's why you send the message a very uh, good robust task force for Mesa City that can address any quickly uh, case that will come out because we expect more cases, but as we move along giving information to our people, uh, I think we can come by the, the disease and won't go farther. But the most thing, I know food, food is available, more uh, food uh, partners, people are giving donations of food is good, but the more things you have, we can come by it. So it can continue to spread. So that should be one of our focus points in the community. Because we will have food to drop out to the, to the homes. I see a lot of big organizations giving food, that's good. Once our poor got food, the next thing is how we can combat the disease so it can spread. As it spreads, they will have more cases and we are now able to do, people now even want more food. We are not worry about food now, we worry about the disease. So we should start call the mechanism we can put in place uh, to combat the disease. So that is, we've got more volunteers in the community of Mesa and uh, to stand for the community, make sure that uh, it's not one person business, it's the everybody. Everybody get out there. If you hear something or you see something, don't hide it. We'll make sure that we control it and make it and put it under control so our book can be safe. So we will come up. Project is doing, we have 100 people already in the community of uh, doing along with uh, Gabriel. We have, uh, we have visited some uh, apartment homes. Um, we drop, we're working along with Salvation Army. They gave us some donation to pass it over to uh, senior citizens and vulnerable community. We're doing that, but the main thing is we have to strategize how we can combat the coronavirus to start its spread. That's what we should be working on right now. Can I chime in? Yes. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Hello, Shante from Project Fix. Um, just an overview of what um, Sekou Dukli was explaining is that we are a organization that is for children that we actually give uh, out shoe donations. We try to kid the, sh uh, sh the sh kids without shoes, but because of the coronavirus, the COVID-19, we're uh, um, in the process of collaborating with a lot of organizations here to help uh, with what's going on here in Mesa. And so what we've come across at the time is uh, lack of a lot of supplies. And so we're really trying to uh, get the supplies so we can give them out to the uh, children. Basically, um, we also do a lot of uh, nonprofit with hair cutting. So to go in to support the children in any way we can and also uh, with the homeless community. So we're just here writing down as a new organization here, all the strategies that has been put in place, but we're also looking to really get to a point where we can slow it down. So we're all concerned too, and also uh, going with the CDC and keeping the, um, the, C the distance and the social distancing. And so we're just really out, um, just meeting a lot of family out here that has needs that we can't even really provide them. So we have a big concern of how to really give them what they need right now. So thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Denise with Overflow, and um, my job just let go, my department alone let go about 67 people. So a lot of them, they do know that I do food boxes. So I, I'm partnered with Midwest Food Bank. Um, that's the only food bank I do work with right now. Um, so other than getting food from them, I have to go out and purchase the food. And now I'm getting more calls for food boxes. So I do need more help with getting food. Um, we do try to get up early in the morning to go purchase food. But I find that when I'm doing that, people are looking at me harsh saying I'm buying too much food, but the food is not for me. It's for the food boxes that we're making. So we just have a shortage on food. Other than going out, buying them and getting them from Midwest, if I don't purchase them, then I can't fulfill a lot of the um, food box orders. And um, I think between yesterday, over the weekend, I had got 10 calls requesting food boxes. And it's just more and more that are coming in. What kind of stuff do you need? Um, um, most people are asking for, of course, toilet paper, um, <laughs> rice, um, beans, whatever. I 
those are the nine things that we always keep in our food box. Those look more like a meal. And how many people do you serve? Um, last, last Friday, I passed out 22 food boxes. 22, okay. Have you ever worked? We'll, we'll talk after. Okay. Thank you, Dave. All right. Okay. Well, Dave, uh, I got a call from Bill Barry the other day, and he told me that all the grocery stores where he's been picking up food are no longer allowing him to pick up the food because they're concerned about their employees that have touched it and what their liability issues are. Do you know anything about that? I mean, he said he's gone from several million pounds of food to like hundred thousand pounds of food uh, the last two weeks. Yeah, so we're seeing about an 80% drop in grocery rescue right now. Um, and that's across the board and across the entire network, across the entire nation. So okay. um, our, all of our enabled agencies are reporting the same thing. Um, Waste Not, a subsidiary that we acquired in July, July uh, they are experiencing the same thing. However, they've, they've been very busy in picking up a restaurant so restaurants that are closing have food in their inventories that they're wanting right. to donate. So we're picking up a lot of that kind of product right now. Um, so one source that they could have is maybe reaching out to some of those folks to see if there's some inventories that they want to donate. But outside of that, if you're not a TFAP agency, we, we are well supplied with USDA commodity. Um, but we're definitely seeing the grocery rescue drop and it'll likely be low for the next, I'm guessing, four to six weeks yeah. until this normalizes. As people realize that, okay, this is my normal, I'm okay with this amount of stuff, you know, they'll turn and they'll realize that, oh wow, I have 50 pounds of rice, I go through, you know, one pound of rice a week, you know, I'm supplied for a year. And so obviously they quit buying and, and so there'll be a cascading effect. But in the meantime, it's still pretty scary. So um, like I said, United Food Bank has uh, a great deal of, of commodity on hand. Um, we have a great agency network. If you tap into one of those agencies, so for example, uh, the folks from uh, Over, Overflow. Overflow Mission, you could refer your clients to uh, food banks within our network. And uh, if they sign up and go through the process, then um, they can receive commodity there. So maybe you just need to refer out for a bit. So, um, and you know, my heart goes out to you. It's, it's, it's tough uh, to, to have to refer out because you don't have what you need, but there are, there are some stuff available still. What we're trying to discourage is um, stocking up, you know, having people come to food banks to stock up because they're panicked. You know, we're here as a supplementary resource to help people that don't have what they need at all, not to add to their already large supply of food. So we, can, you? we can't ask that question, Mark. Is that what you're going to ask? But we can continue to um, ask about their income eligibility. So we're trying to stay focused on our low and moderate income folks. If they present as hungry, we serve them. Uh, so we don't know if they will, uh, you know, we, we don't ask for IRS records to find out if they're totally income eligible, but. Uh, okay, uh, note here, Mesa Can is open to serving Mesa residents with utility and rental assistance. So folks, uh, if you have clients that have uh, rental assistance needs, and utility assistance needs. We're starting to see the tip of this. Most people are getting their last full paychecks probably last week and this week um, that are experiencing layoffs maybe next week. And so I'm guessing more into April, you're gonna see a lot more demand for utility assistance and uh, rental assistance. Mesa Can is open, uh, so please refer your clients to Mesa Can. They are um, changing their service delivery a little bit to keep safe, keep that in mind. Um, so I always try to make, you know, help people understand that we're trying to keep safe. It's not that we don't like folks or that there's, you know, we, we want to make sure we instill dignity in any time we serve people in poverty under the circumstances, let's treat people as kindly as we can, even though we're taking precautions to keep our distance. So again, make the can is open. So one more thing, the city isn't doing any evictions, right? No utility cutoff right now. Is that correct? That's what we're hearing, yeah. So they're not doing any water or electric or gas uh, cutoffs during this time. And not allowing for any evictions, the last I heard. So, you know, part of what we're doing, so we've been raising some funds at Macy United Way and trying to figure out what to, how to distribute them. 
And right now we're just hanging on to it because I, I don't believe people are getting evicted or having utility issues right now. But come April and May, we're going to have that. That's going to be a glut of need, I think. Yeah, Mark, I think you're right. Um, like we were saying, you know, folks have got their, they're still getting uh, their last full paycheck. And so, uh, yeah, definitely April and May are the ones that is going to be a big concern. And Mark, also, uh, Governor Ducey did ex uh, do an ex executive order today that there'd be no evictions in the state. Right. So, so people will be okay until that changes and then the landlords will try to collect all those dollars. So that's the place I'm trying to make sure that we're set up for is when that hits. I'm concerned about is that. Is there, um, Mark and uh, Dave, are, are there any discussions about some of the money at the federal level that's being freed up? And could that be used for uh, utility and rent assistance? Or is there another round of FEMA money in the works? So Jenny, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. So the disaster declaration that President Trump used was the Stafford Act, not the FEMA emergency declaration. So there's not, so far we haven't seen additional FEMA. We had FEMA funds that we've distributed out. It We distributed all of our FEMA food to Maricopa, Navajo and Apache County. We manage the funds and Pinal County. So we've gotten all that food out. Because this isn't a national emergency declaration under FEMA, the, we're, we're not anticipating any more food there. There are some changes to some distributions related to that, the other act, which is, I think it was called the Stafford or the, I think it's called the Stafford Act that he used. So it's a little bit different. We can change a few things. Um, as far as federal assistance, what, what we're hearing from the bills uh, that are floating around the different incarnations that if federal assistance is coming, I was on a call with USDA on Monday morning, and uh, if any federal assistance is funded, that we would likely not see it for up to six months. So it could be that we're expending money now that we get federal reimbursed for down the road. So, um, you know, not uh, fancy how that goes. Well, the interesting part is the state, on the other hand, is uh, pass is working on some relief bills that would ex expedite be able to expedite funds in between now and when federal funding is received. So the state is cognizant of this issue, and they're working on a solution in the legislature uh, to see if they can come up with some solutions for getting additional funding out on the streets for for these issues that uh, Jenny brought up, utility assistance and those kinds of things. So. Yeah, I think especially, Dave, for rent, because we're really going to see that hit in April and May when people aren't going to be covered by a no eviction notice. And by that time, they'll be two or three or four months behind, and they're really going to be in trouble. So um, we may, you may want to talk with Angie about talking with our congressional and Senate members and seeing if they could put a B under somebody's bonnet to get the FEMA funds increased and working sooner than October. Yeah, Jenny, good later. instincts. Is, Jenny, good instincts as usual. That is indeed the conversations that are taking place now. So, so Angie's all over that and she's uh, pushing really hard. Um, we've had some regular, pretty regular calls with Senator McSally's office and, and Senator, um, uh, Kirsten in office. I had Kirsten in my mind because she's so familiar to everybody. Um, and so those conversations are taking place as new Senate negotiations continue. Okay. Good question. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone else? Um, a comment again from Ava. Yes, uh, it is It is slow for now, but they anticipate the needs in April, May, so everybody has the same hunch. Uh, please note that the Arizona Department of Housing is looking to partner with community action programs to help with eviction prevention programs in the near future. As she learns them, she will share them back with the group. So I think everybody is feeling a little sensitive about the eviction issue, uh, trying to keep people housed in place. Um, and, you know, the uh, landlords, families need to eat as well, you know, and they, they probably rely on that rent to pay their own bills. And so um, we know that there's a circular issue there. So it sounds like there's a lot of groups working on that. Eva, thanks for those comments. 
Um, at, uh, Larry says at MVRC, we are leveraging social networks to disseminate information about services as we learn about them. So, uh, another resource for everyone, the Mesa Chamber of Commerce does have a whole uh, link off their homepage to um, resources uh, for folks to be able to turn to for both businesses and individuals. Uh, okay, so Sally's telling me they have uh, resources from the federal to the local level that are available uh, to help folks as they might need it. So we're approaching the five o'clock hour. I think we committed an hour to this call. Is there anybody else that wants to, uh, to weigh in or add comments? Thanks for all the great questions and conversations. I find it inspiring uh, to interact with Mesa's uh, uh, nonprofit community, always on the front lines of issues. People are willing to step up and and really help out. Uh, we have some very high capacity organizations here, and we have some lower capacity organizations, but they all seem to band together when it matters most. We're going to open it up one last time for comments uh, to the group. Mark, it's time to fire up that saxophone, it sounds like. Everybody's uh, made their comments. If you could take us out with a little uh, music, Mark, that would be great. I would just get out as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> Mark, you really need to get a razor and some sleep. <laughs> I've had plenty of sleep, and the razor's not coming out till this is over. I'm not joking. I kind of like this. Yeah. Well, at least you do. So, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Tally's telling me that we will plan a follow-up call in two weeks. Right. Um, and unless something big comes in the next week and we feel a need to get the group together again, uh, if you have a need for resource, food resources, please reach out to United Food Bank. We're happy to help uh, where we can. And uh, thank you for all that you guys all, that everyone on this call does. And those that didn't, weren't able to make the call, uh, a great community. I'm proud to be part of Mesa right now, and but we do have a lot of work ahead of us. So uh, we'll look forward to talking to everyone in two weeks. Uh, if people feel like we need to get the group together sooner, we will do so. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye.